Uh, there was another title. Uh, if you ask me later, I'll tell you what it was. Uh, hello, I'm Chris Matz. Um, uh, I'm a blogger, and uh, every time I publish a blog, within about 30 minutes, Anthony Green goes, you're crap. <laughs> in fact, you're crap. And, and he says it in that affectionate way, because he says, you're not as good as Dave Snowden. I mean, what does that mean? <laughs> um, so anyway, I, I, he said to me, he goes, uh, will you come and do a talk to the London CD group? I went, sure. I mean, the fact that people are still using CDs, haven't heard of DVDs and Wi-Fi and stuff, you know. Um, and I said, great. And he, I said, w why? And he says, well, it's great because you, uh, you get to go and see these really cool places because it's never in the same place. We always go around and see really cool places. Oh, yeah, okay. Sign me up. And so they did. And, they, and, they, and, I, and someone said, um, do you know where you're holding it? I said, no. He goes, uh, World Remit. So out of curiosity, who knows what World Remit is? The, the, the hosts for tonight. Yeah, some people should know because they come and work here. Well, they're actually my client. <coughs> so I'm like, oh, great, I get to go and uh, have fun at my clients. And <coughs> they find out how crap I am as a public speaker. Um, World Remit are great fun because they're a post-startup organization. You know, they've done everything really fast to get the business established. And now they're trying to fix all those problems that you kind of accrue when you grow fast to fix all these things. But it's, it's an amazing business as well. Uh, what they do is they, they allow people to send payments around the world. And I thought, so what? I can do that. I can go to bank, Lloyd's, kind of send a payment somewhere. Because no, no. What happens is as people come from like Singapore and they go and work in America or they come from Zimbabwe and they go and work in London. And then they send money home. I said, well, what's the big deal? I said, they don't have banks. Where they're sending the money to, they don't have banks. So they do this cool stuff, like they send money to people on mobile phones. Or they send money to kind of like a little corner shop in the middle of nowhere. And you have to go in and get the money from the corner shop. So it's, it's a really cool place to work. And uh, that, that's my way of saying uh, it's, it's really cool. And I think they're even hiring. So I think there's someone over there looking at you and kind of taking photos of you. So yes, they work for us now. Yeah. Anyway, for all the World Remit people could just say hello and just wave to everyone else, then they can say so. So, so say hello to these people later because they're being our hosts for this evening. Okay, so teaching your unicorns to fly and paint rainbows. This is my debut as a thought leader. This is my first ever thought leader talk. I'm going to talk about something I know absolutely nothing about, but you won't notice because I'll say it in a way that makes you think, wow, this guy's a genius. I know nothing about microservices other than what I learned on an obscure little email group last year. And they pointed me at a few videos and I watched it. So I, I think I actually know less about microservices than everyone in this room, including the people from HR, because at least they know what questions to ask people when they're trying to recruit people who know microservices. Tr teaching your unicorn to fly and paint rainbows. Does anyone know how to teach a unicorn to fly? It is so easy. It is so, so easy. All you do is you go, you point at the sky, and they fly. Do you know how to get them to paint rainbows? Yeah, you, you feed them marshmallows, and they paint the sky with, with, with rainbows. And that's where all rainbows come. That's the easy bit. What's the hard bit with the unicorns? How do you find them? <laughs> yeah, once you've got a unicorn, that's great. And, and this is my reaction to a couple of talks I've seen on microservices where I've looked at them and gone, what? So this is, this is the talk. And I'm not going to pick on anyone in particular, but it's easy to get the unicorn to do these things. It's harder to find them. And so I've got a talk. And I just, I just want you guys to listen to this talk. This is the one that inspired this but talk. Every single company I know of that's done microservices started with a monolith. And only when they really understood their domain did they switch to microservices because, as Martin Fowler points out, refactoring is easy in a monolith. It's not easy with microservices. So if you don't get the structure right, it's really hard to refactor it. So that's probably why the success stories come from companies that started with monoliths, because that's where they got their feet wet and learned how to do this, learned what the right partitions were, and then went as appropriate to microservices. So I think we still have to say microservices have some serious risk. They're not the answer to everything. But if you can limit that risk, maybe they're the answer to, they certainly give you low friction. 
But you know, microservices and internet stuff is not the only kind of system there is. In fact, it's not actually the kind of system I worked on because I... Did you see that? Microservices are great, but then there's a bit, well, there's this problem with them. And I thought that's what the talk's going to be about. But no, it's about something else. And that's what you find. So let's refine that so that you could actually see the core message of that talk. Only when they really understood their domain did they switch to microservices. Only when they really understood their domain did they switch to microservices. Only when they really understood their domain did they switch to microservices. Really understood their domain. Really understood their domain. <laughs> really understood their domain. Really understood their domain. Do you get the message? <laughs> but, but when I've looked in this kind of area, the, the, I, I was like, well, well, how do you understand the domain? And that is your question. So what I want you to do is say hello to the person sitting next to you, even if you're kind of afraid of sitting next to people. That's your person. I'm going to give you a minute to just have a quick say hi, and then how do you understand your domain? Off you go. I'll give you two minutes. Go on, I'm going to be generous. Go on. It's not my time. Go on. So say hello to the person next to you and discuss. How do you understand your domain? Okay, everybody, you've had your chance. So has anyone got any ideas they want to throw out there? How do you understand your domain? Someone check out. Build it. Build it. Okay, yeah, that's, that's what we call the cheap option. Actually, whenever I do projects, I'm a business analyst, by the way. That's why I know nothing about technology. Uh, actually, if you actually look at the history of establishing the domain, the most expensive way you can actually understand the domain is build the system and then when you know what you actually needed, then you build it again. It's called the Chrysler C3 project. Okay? Coffee. Co copy. Coffee. 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 Yeah. You understand the domain by co <laughs> Right. <laughs> what do you mean by domain? What do I, what do I, I don't know. It, I'm, not, I'm not the person using the word. What's the domain of the domain? Exactly. <laughs> Have a conversation with people working in that area for a long time. Any, any other? Like, we'll have one more. Pa <laughs> oh, the coffee is the enabler for the conversation. Oh, it's an enhanced conversation. Pastries. Pardon? Pastries. And pastries. Ooh, the, at you, matey. <laughs> make a board game out of the, uh, what people do. Uh, make a board game out of what people do. Try and, uh, model it. try and model it. Ah, I like you. But we'll come back to you in a minute. So. Um, the, the, the perceived wisdom is domain-driven design, and actually, as, as our colleague said, uh, when you look at domain-driven design, it said basically, uh, there's a lot of words there, it says blah blah, talk to a domain expert. <laughs> it's like, get a developer talking to a domain expert, and then it says, this is the important part of the design, there's long discussions between software architects or developers and the domain experts, blah blah, lots of talking, yes. Um, <laughs> And so then we get an example of a conversation. Developer, we want to monitor air traffic. Where do we start? Expert, let's start with the basics. All the traffic is made up of planes. But you'll see that the word planes is in kind of bold letters. So we need to look out for those words in bold letters. So when you're talking, look for the words that are in bold, because it helps. And so we go through. There's departures, routes, blah. And there's more of it. And look, we end up with a model. Yeah. So you've heard it, you, you know domain-driven design, so what you've got now is you've got two minutes and you're going to develop a domain model. So if someone can kind of hand all of this out, what I want you to do is in your pairs, one of you is going to be the domain expert, yeah? and the domain is shopping, right? and the other is the developer. And what I want you to do is develop a model, and you've got two minutes just talking. Actually, I'm cheating a bit because I'm going to give more time to the other one. But the idea is that we've got a, a website and um, we, we want to be able to let our customers order stuff and then someone's going to come along and pick stuff. Yeah? And kind of we'll then send it to them. You could call it tesco.com if you like or Ocado or something like that. Right? You ready? So you've got two minutes. One of you, who, who, please, if you're a subject matter expert in shopping, can you put your hand up? Sorry. Yeah, because you probably want to be, you, you are the one who doesn't want to be holding the paper. The other person is the developer. So I'm going to give you two minutes to have a conversation with your subject matter expert about shopping. 
and then I want to see some domain models. Off you go, two minutes, go. Okay. Has anyone got a good model? Has anyone got a good domain model from having a conversation with a subject matter expert? Anyone? Anyone? No one's feeling brave today. You don't count, because you've had too much coffee. <laughs> Do you have a good model? Would you like to share? Okay, cool. You might not be able to read my scroll, but... There's a, a list injection, there's a browse thing, there's a shop product reconciler, and there's a shop. Not bad. Better than most developers. <laughs> okay. Ah, it's over there. That's the great thing about those clickers that prevent you from having to walk all over and press the thing on the thing. You can see a laptop easy. You can't see one of these so easy. Right. Right, we've just, just done that. So I'm going to introduce you to a new approach to doing this, rather than domain-driven des design, which is called information smells. Yeah, slight clue in the slide. So um, information smells is a very simple process. What you do is you get your user, the person who's going to be using the thing, to actually draw the output they want to see in the system. Like so with the air traffic controller thing, they would actually draw out the thing and I'm going to do an example and walk through this for you so that we can do this and then you're going to do your own. We have a crack at this, doing it with, a, um, with our shopping example in a second. So you've seen how easy it is to do it with domain-driven design. Now we'll do, a shop, we'll do it with information smells. In a minute. So in this example, what we've got is an IT department. Sorry, the, the HR manager has said, right, I want to report... And on that report, I want to see the average salary for everyone in the department. So the average salary is 45K. And I want to see how much everyone in the department earns because I'm worried about being sued for discrimination. Yeah? That's the idea. So I know why he wants it. He doesn't want to get sued. And he's sketched out the report, and I can have a conversation very focused about what do you need this for. So what we'll do now is we'll show you information smells as a process on how to generate a model from that, because apparently understanding the domain is important. So let us show the process. So the first part of the process is Informate first smell that we have is information is missing from the domain model. So here's our domain model. What does it have on it? Nothing. So someone shout out a piece of information on the report that the business want that's not on the, on the domain model. Average salary. Average salary. So that is, what, probably a calculated value of department. So we'll just have department. We'll call it get average salary. And we'll use this get thing because... That, that, that indicates it's calculated value, apparently. Object people do something like that. Uh, another attribute on the report. Pardon? Is that on the report? <laughs> it might help if you can see the report. <laughs> uh, well, no, because well, your business user has uh, told you what the report is he wants to see, and now you're telling him he's got stuff missing. That's, we'll come to that one in a second. Because our tendency is to just go, yeah, length of tenure, stick it on there. Yeah? Uh, in fact, we could put length of tenure on there, but I'll come to that one in a sec. Someone else, can anyone see anything else on the report? Department name. Department name. So we've got department name. Why have I picked up this green pen when no one can see it? I even put the black pen next to this. There we go. So we've got department, we've got average salary, we've got name. Another one, please. Pardon? Employee, yeah. So, employee, uh, oh, but that's an employee. That's probably the kind of the object. But what's the attribute that we actually see there? It's their name. Okay. Uh, another one. Salary. So, salary of an employee. Another. Yeah, Jedi. Race. So yeah, we've got race. I'm going to stick that up there. 
We're not quite sure, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll put that, and it's actually the name of a race. Another one? Roll. Roll? Yeah. Roll. And once again, that's the name of the roll. So everything on that report has to be kind of an attribute or a calculated value over here on our domain model. Another one? Gender. Gen uh, gender, yep. Uh, gender. And so there's kind of a name of the gender, male or female or whatever. Any more? Well, the, 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 that's represented on a model. What, we've got salary, so yeah, it, we can stop now, can't we? It's an obvious stopping point because we've got everything we want on there. Okay, second, so what I'm going to put, what was that thing that you said? The tenure. Yeah. Tenure, we'll add that on now as an example because, you know, you know that we need tenure on there. So, right, second smell that we have, information in the domain model that is not needed on the output. Is there anything on here now, like tenure, <laughs> that the business have not asked for? It's a smell. It's not saying it's wrong, but we've got to have a conversation with the business to find out, do they actually want tenure, rather than let's just assume that we do. So we'll say we don't. Um, quite often people say we need date of birth, but it's not on there. They'll say date of birth. And it's like, well, there's nothing on there, but perhaps age is important. Yeah, we might decide, yes, age. Once again, is age... An attribute or calculated value. Yeah. So let's put get age. We don't need date of birth, but what we do need is get age. Cool. Is Step two. Exactly, and they're the kind of things that we'd see, and you can actually have a better conversation around that output rather than just a general conversation with the HR guy. So we've now got all these things. So information in the domain model not needed on the output, right? We've got nothing on here that's on there and nothing there that's there. Right, two pieces of information in one place. Is there any field on here that contains two pieces of information? Name. Yeah. So we might decide, and once again, it's a smell. It's not a definite, but we might go and have a word with the HR director and say, do you want to be able to see first name and family name separate? Because if you're looking for discrimination, it might be interesting to see if certain names cluster around kind of certain salaries. We'll leave that for there, but it's a smell. Second, no relationships. So there's no relationships between any of this stuff. So we can have a conversation with them again. So... What's the relationship? Is there a relationship between employee and role? Well, yes, there is. Between gender and employee, yes. Uh, between race and employee, yes. What is the relationship between employee and department? And they go, well, actually, every employee is in a team, and the teams are in a department. OK, so we've got a team. No attributes on team. So there are lots of team. Oh, sorry. There's a relationship there. OK. So that's that one. The next one is one-to-one -one relationships. So if anything where you're looking at it and it's got a one-to-one -one relationship, you go, is that valid or not? So we go, right, we've got a one-to-one -one relationship between role and employee. So the question we ask is, are there any examples of where there are more than one employee in the same role? Yeah? We're not looking what's the general rule, it's are there any examples? And we say, yeah, actually there's lots of developers. Are there any employees who do more than one role? And we say, actually, the way our company is structured, they don't do that. The same with race. Uh, sorry, the same with gender. Uh, do we have any genders like male? Do we have more than one male employee? Oh, yeah, yeah, we've got loads. Great. So, so, so uh, gender and for race, what's the sort of pool of options you're drawing from? Does that fit into your smell? It's going to pop straight out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so don't forget, this is about... Uh, discrimination this report uh, do we have any employees with more than one gender could be. could be yeah we might have an employee who is not kind of a binary in terms of gender but this is important so this is a question but what might happen the HR director might say you know what I don't want to actually model that in the system 
and I don't want to alert the rest of the employees of those kind of options. I just want to keep it quiet. Um, I worked with a colleague who'd worked on a uh, dating site, a rather interesting one, and he said they had nine different genders in the system. Yeah? When it comes to dating, that's important. Um, so, yeah, that could be more than one. That's our domain, but it doesn't mean we implement it. Similarly, uh, department, do we have more than one team in a department? Yes. Do we have a team in more than one department? Well, not the way we've set up our company. Do we have an example of a team with more than one employee? Yes. Can an employee work in more than one team? Ooh, actually, yeah, that, that sometimes happens. Yeah. Um, and the same with race. It's a similar answer to the one with uh, gender. Now, so that's our one-to-one -one relationships managed. Now we look at the next smell, which is we have many-to-many -many relationships. So we've discussed gender. I don't want to go there anymore. But what about team and employee? This is about salary. What might be, because what this indicates is there's normally a missing relationship here. Yeah, there's something in there. We don't know what it is. But it's a bad smell. There's something missing. Yeah? What might that be? Mm, not so much. When we're calculating the salary, we're looking at someone and we've got one person in IT who's earning, say, 50,000, and someone in HR who's earning 500,000, and then there's a person who's working in both departments. What might indicate where their salary should be? It's really what's the allocation of work. How much work do they do as a HR person versus how much work do they do as a lowly peon developer type? Yeah? So we'd have an allocation. But once again, what's happening is the model is just the smells coming out. Yeah. And then the last one is undefined function. So we've got get average salary and get age. So I'm not going to do both because it gets boring, but get average salary, uh, get age. So how do we calculate get age? Get age equals, in business terms, what is it? Today, minus employee date of birth, over 365. Yep. Ah, date of birth is missing. We now know why we need it. Very fast, I'm sorry, this is kind of quite a, an in-depth one. What I want to show is by having the report to work from, it's actually pretty easy. Yeah? So what I want to do now is I'm just going to give you five minutes. And this time, when we're doing our example about shopping, what you're going to have is a receipt. Because the guy who does the, because we were saying we were going to do this thing, we wanted to do the picking. Well, what they're going to pick is going to look very much like the receipt. So it's almost like you've gone around, done the shopping, hit, hand it out in the receipt, and then someone goes and picks up all the food for you. Yeah? Because that's what picking is like. So another exercise. With your, in your pairs, a model, please, in the field of shopping. So on the back is the, the seven smells. So just literally work through the smells one at a time. Okay, everybody. So how did people get on that time? Yeah? So the conversation that you want, uh, did anyone find it easier earlier on? Did anyone prefer domain-driven design where you were just having a free-flowing conversation? Did, and did anyone prefer this time? Yeah. 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 So the conversation you're having with your business is, what do you actually want to see? Where's the value that we're going to generate? And then you can focus your building up the domain based on that rather than that. So did anyone actually manage to pull out anything that looks a bit like a domain model that time? Yeah? 
and it's just practice. Hopefully you can see that if you can get, if, if you kind of talk about domains, it, the conversation just goes off in random places. But if you can just get them to sit and draw and say, so if I give you that, are you going to be happy? If I can give you that report, are you going to be happy? And they're like, yeah, cool. And then you can start working on bringing out your domain model. So that's really the thing. Have the conversation about the output that you're producing for them rather than just a free-flowing thing. And then all of a sudden, it's a lot easier to extract the domain from what you're trying to do. Yeah? You don't have to go through all this iteration and kind of build all these abstract models, because actually that's all you need. Yeah? And so you do that, and then you do another report or, or another output, because you know, a screen is just a moving report. Um, and you can gradually build it up. But focus on that output. Is this what you want to see? OK, if you can see that. And forget about all the inputting stuff until later, because that will just drop out the back. So you don't, you don't even need to worry. Like, Get some confidence, because you don't even need to worry about the date of birth. You don't have to try and be clever and predict stuff, because if you, got it, you know that age is a calculated value. You just know as you go through the process, it's just going to pop out. OK, that, that's kind of all I've got to say. In fact, I haven't even got any more slides. But hopefully what I've done is draw, help you see that there's a little map that can help you find your precious little unicorns. That's it. Thank you, everybody.